Philippians 1, 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. We're talking a win-win situation, even in the worst of times. The next number of weeks, make sure you don't miss our Wednesday night Bible studies going through Philippians. It's going to be awesome. Uh, just to set a little bit of, of a, a backdrop, um, there are four books or letters that were written during the time that uh, Paul was uh, under house arrest. And uh, so he was not allowed to go where he wanted to. Uh, he did have opportunity for people to come and see him. There was also opportunity for him to write during this, this, uh, these uh, probably four years that he was under house arrest. And, and so we get uh, four letters that he writes. So there's uh, Ephesians. There's Philippians that we're going through. There's Colossians, or three. And there's uh, Philemon as well. Uh, just, a sh one, uh, just a short uh, one chapter uh, letter that he writes um, as well. And so we have this, uh, these powerful, powerful letters, all especially um, Ephesians and, and Colossians and, and this book of Philippians, uh, very strong letters of encouragement uh, for us. And uh, there's direction given uh, in, all, in each and every one of them for our good. And um, just, uh, it says uh, in uh, Philippians 3 verse 1, it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And uh, this word rejoice is exactly what you think it is, is to be glad in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. And there's uh, some direction given uh, for this to happen. How can I be glad in the Lord? How can I rejoice in the Lord? Uh, just before we get into a number of these uh, passages, uh, just just a, a little a question so that we can get into this in a, to a deeper extent. Uh, does anybody know when, when the Bible refers to the flesh, and there's going to be a reference to the flesh uh, invol involved in, in some of these verses. In fact, a large part of these verses have to do with the flesh. And uh, does anybody know, what does it mean, the flesh? Sorry? Our shell, okay. This earthly shell, okay. Sorry? So when you say carnal, what do you, what do you mean by that, carnal? Okay, so... So you're saying our flesh is not what we should be thinking about, okay? So these carnal things, okay? Our flesh is evil, the spirit, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, yeah? Okay, so the absence of the Holy Spirit, um, there will be some, some discussion on that. Um, so maybe not the absence of the spirit, but the the fact that the flesh is opposed to the spirit. Okay, so uh, there's an opposing of the flesh. Uh, what else can flesh be? Could be our thoughts. So our thoughts, where this is where carnality may come come in, is our human thoughts. All right, so uh, his. Ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, re referring to God. Yes. Okay, so, so in this regard, flesh being the temple of, of God is actually our body is a temple of God. So this body that we have uh, is the temple of, of God or as a child of God. 
as a child of God. Um, any, anyone else? What else is if, if uh, when it comes to perhaps relying on the flesh, if I say I'm relying on the flesh, what would that mean when I'm relying on the flesh? Sorry? Our actions? Okay, okay. when you say actions regarding our flesh, how, how would, would you mean... All right, so our, our flesh would be those things that are, are about not walking. We're not walking the way we should be walking. We're walking according to the flesh. We're thinking according to the flesh. We're, th we're doing according to the flesh. Let me just uh, also, let, let me just give you something uh, to think about. Uh, when it comes to our flesh, because sometimes we, we, we don't quite get an idea of what, what the flesh is, because there's, there's parts of us that we say, well, that's, those aren't bad things. So, when it comes to the flesh, it, it also is about our abilities. Our abilities, our capabilities, our efforts. So, if I make it personal, because flesh has to do with, with me, and your flesh has to do with you, so it would be my abilities, my capabilities, my efforts in doing what God would, God would have me do. And you say, that doesn't sound so bad. My ability, my capability, my effort to be who God would have me be. Doesn't sound bad. There is, as, as I would give you that about my effort, my righteousness, there's a this aspect of placing trust in yourself. And you say, that doesn't seem that bad either. But we're going to see, we're going to be talking about the flesh. So just think about those things as we get into it. Now, this verse, we, uh, he says in this very first verse, Philippians 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, this thing of finally, you say, well, that's, it's the beginning of, of the chapter, why does it say finally? So, any idea that where we should look if we want to continue, before we continue on, where, should, where do we need to look if it says finally? We need to look at what's coming before that. And the, the chapter that comes before it, if you didn't catch last week's service, check it out. Uh, if you weren't here, uh, check out uh, the message last week week and um, this chapter two is all about uh, humility it is all about submission in chapter two and I just I want to read Philippians 2 5 to 11 there's this this way of thinking that needs to be within each and every one of us and so it says, in verse 5, it says, Let this mind, this way of thinking, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So this is where Jesus was at, especially in coming to this planet and being, having this, this shell, as was mentioned earlier, this shell, this, this tent, this body, he came in the flesh as a human being. He did not come uh, as a spirit. He came fully as in human form, all right? So it says, let this mind, this, these, this way of thinking, be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So what way of thinking? Who being in the form of God, 
even though he was God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he didn't say, hey, I have to be here or, or continue to have all the uh, capabilities and attributes of God, which he did. But he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and I'm going to uh, be fully human as well. So he came and he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. Can anybody remember what a bondservant is? Okay, this is, it's more than a willing servant because you can have servants that are, are willing. They're not bond servants. There you go. So a bond servant is one that is given freedom. Uh, they were a, a slave of the master of a master. And so this term bond servant, th there were bond servants in that day and age that had, uh, the, they had worked and the master said to them, their master said to them, listen, I am setting you free. You are free to go. You have served me. You have served me well and I'm letting you go. You are no longer a slave. You are no longer a servant of mine and you are free to do what you want to do. The bond servant would say, Master, I don't want to go. I willingly, I will continue to serve you. There was a, there was a marking. Yeah, there was a, a piercing of the ear. Uh, and uh, so this mark on these bond servants, there's a recognition of the fact that they were willing or uh, servants a bond servant willingly, so he took the form of a bond servant to God Almighty, and coming in the likeness of man or men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So there's this thing of humbling self, and even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And he was led there by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led Jesus right to the cross. And he went and he died for us willingly. Therefore, therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's two things that are mentioned here. One, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So there's a, a, uh, there's a choice being made or offered and, and should be made. And there, that choice is optional at this time. As in every man, every person, when I say man, I mean every human person should bow before the Lord and confess, Jesus Christ, you are Lord in my life. Should. All right? So there's, there's an opportunity for that. We as believers need to, to, as Jesus submitted to the Father and allowed the Holy Spirit to lead him right to the cross, Jesus is saying, let this mind be in you. Or uh, Paul is saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This thing of submission and of humility before Jesus Christ. Now, that's the main gist of chapter 2. The, the blessing that comes in submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I willingly, I bow my knee and I confess, Jesus, you are my Lord. And so there's, with this confession, it is a confession of faith and it's an act that we do. I surrender and submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Not my will, your will be done in my life. Now, 
This is now, we get into chapter 3, and it says, finally. So you know that. You've grabbed a hold of it. Finally, it says, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. And then he starts talking about some, some interesting things. He says, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. I, I want you, this is, this is not tedious for, for me to write these things. I'm writing these things to you. It's, this is important. You need to get this. He's saying, yeah, rejoice in the Lord. And now he's, he's going to explain, how can I rejoice in the Lord? Paul is incarcerated. He's, he's rejoicing. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord, even in my incarceration. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I don't know if he knew how much longer he would have to be in, uh, under house arrest. But he's writing here this book to this church of Philippi, to the believers in Philippi. And he's saying, I want you to rejoice in the Lord. I, I want for you, as we, as I write these things, as you take these things in, this is for your good. This is for your safety. And then he, he, he says three things very quickly. He says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Beware of the mutilation. Like, what? Is he talking about dogs? We're not talking about, you know, your pet dog. Uh, this thing here was, uh, it, it was a, a, a slur against the Jews. If, if they called you a dog, uh, that was not a positive thing. It was a very, a, a huge slur and put down. So he's saying, beware of dogs. Like these individuals that are, are not out for your, your well-being. Of these evil workers, they are evil workers, beware of the mutilation. So now we're starting to see a little bit about uh, I, what is this? My, my first question would be if, it's, if we stop right there. What is he talking about mutilation? So we... we we read and we'll continue to read uh, in the next verse. We, we get an idea of what that is. And I'm, I'm going to read uh, verse 3. It says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, and I'll explain that. Now, before I, I, we get into the, the verses that follow, I want to jump to the very end of this chapter. And I want to I bring out the point right away at the end, the end of the chapter. Okay? And then we're, we're going to go back and we'll continue on. All right? Because he's making a point and, and he, he makes it at the very end. I want to make it at the very beginning. All right? Talking about the flesh. He says, he's talking about dogs, evil workers, beware of the mutilation. And at the very end of this, of the chapter, Math, or Philippians 3.17, he says, brethren, join in following my example, my example to have gladness and to rejoice, even in the worst of times, so today, I'm, I'm, I, the title is to rejoice or rejoicing in the worst of times. Can I, how do I do this? How can I rejoice in the worst of times? Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. The things that I'm going through, you, you, you don't experience. You don't know them. I'm going through them. How can I rejoice? How can you say rejoice? How, how can Paul say rejoice in the Lord? And so he's saying, I want you to join in following my example. In other words, to have gladness, even in the worst of times, to rejoice in the Lord and note or observe, 
observe those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, so he says, I want you to observe some that walk in a certain way. And also, when it comes to how we walk, after our, our pattern, like we would walk, but for many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, what would you say, what does that mean to be an enemy of the cross of Christ? We're talking about how can I, how can I have joy, how can I rejoice in the Lord when I'm not in a good situation? In fact, I'm in bad situations. I, I, my life isn't good. How can I rejoice? What does it mean to walk as an enemy of the cross of Christ? For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Any ideas? Unbelievers, not Christian. They walk in a worldly way. Sorry? They're not following the way. They know something's wrong. They may do it anyways. Sorry? Disobedience to God? Okay, it's way more narrow than that, way more specific. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Who Jesus is, the cross of Christ is not just any cross. Listen, there were thousands and tens of thousands of people that were crucified during the time of Jesus, before and after. Do you know that? Jesus was not the only person crucified. There were many that were crucified. The reason that they used crucifixion was deter people from opposing the empire, the Roman Empire. And so they had formed this, this hideous and extremely painful way to die and it would jesus died in within six hours there would be people that would be hanging on a cross not just for six hours they would be hanging on a cross sometimes for a number of days before they died okay so this we're not talking about crucifixion as in just any crucifixion we are talking those that they walk in a way that is as an enemy of the cross of Christ. Specifically, Jesus Christ and what he did for us. They're saying, no, 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 I, I, no, absolutely not. Don't talk to me about that. Or they may not say, don't talk to me about it. They're opposed, they're opposed to it. Even it seems, even as believers, they get to a place to deviate that Jesus Christ and him crucified is something that I, I'm rejecting as a believer. Now, I, I'm talking about the, when it comes to many walk, does anybody know, like are we talking about the, the way they walk? What does it mean, a person's walk? The way they conduct themselves? Their lifestyle? Okay, a person's walk through life is basically their, the way they live their life on a daily basis. That's a person's walk. How do you live life daily? 
And so here, the thing about walking is there's, there's this moving forward, right? We move forward through the day in time. Like there was a lot of things that happened today in my life. And I'm sure there were many things that happened today in your life. And you may look back and you just say, well, how did I, how did I walk through this day? Did I walk through this day as someone that loves and appreciates, recognizes, acknowledge, acknowledges the cross of Christ? Or did I go through this day in my own strength, in my own capabilities, in my own ways? And so here, Paul is saying there, there's this point that a person can get. See, I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to the cross of Christ, even to the message of the cross of Christ. Because really, this is something that happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus is no longer on the cross. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He's on the right hand of the Father. So we can't say, hey, we can't go back in time to the cross that was 2,000 years ago. So all that we have is this message of the cross. It has to do with what, how we view who Jesus is and what he did for us 2,000 years ago. What, what is our take on that as a believer daily? Now, we're, we're talking about rejoicing in the worst of times. We're talking about, can I rejoice in the worst of times? And I'll tell you right now, for myself, I've come to recognize when, when all hell is breaking loose or things are happening that, that is out of my control or whatever, it is, as I look at the situation, is very difficult for me to rejoice, humanly speaking. In fact, I'm caught up oftentimes in the, the extent of it, in the the extreme of it and the impossibility of these things that are coming at me and it's like how can I rejoice and so I'm overwhelmed today I'm, I, I had one two three four four different situations four different people and there were they were impossible situations there's nothing that I can do about it there's nothing I can do about it and so I can't even understand or I, I can, I don't know what, how they're feeling because they're impossible situations, extreme situations. And so from a human point of view, and this is where we as, as believers that are not enemies of the cross, listen, for goodness sake, point people to Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago for our well-being, for our victory, for our overcoming through, through the day, the walk through the day, that it would be one of rejoicing. It says rejoice in the Lord. And it's, it's like, well, you know what? My focus needs to change if I'm going to rejoice in negative situations. So how can I rejoice in a negative situation I can't rejoice in the as I view the negative situation. So I need to take my eyes off the situation. I need to start rejoicing in the Lord. Amen. I'm looking to the Lord in all of this. And I've, I'm recognizing I don't want to be an enemy of the cross of Christ. As in, you know what? No, you, Jesus, you can't do anything here. Listen, I, I have people when I, when I say, when I talk about the simplicity of Christ... It is not a complicated thing. The simplicity of Jesus Christ and him crucified is not complicated. And so I will have people, they're, they're telling me their situations, and I say, hey, listen, you know what? Acknowledge Jesus, that the fact that he is above all things, and not just Jesus Christ, but acknowledge him as Lord in your life, 
He's Lord of my life. I, I'm, I'm his bondservant. I'm going to be the same mind that was in Jesus. I'm going to be your bondservant, Jesus. And I'm going to submit to your lordship. And I'm going to recognize the fact that you loved me so much that you died for me and you overcame everything that there is to overcome even by your death on the cross. Not even in your resurrection. We're talking in your death. And the, it says that the power and the wisdom of God flow through this sacrifice of Jesus. The passage that you hear me quote again and again, 1 Corinthians 1.18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. They're spiraling down. And the message of the cross is like, no, I don't want to listen. There's an opposition to, no. Don't talk to me about that. But it is. That same message is the power of God to those that are being saved, not just were saved. For me, many years ago when I was seven. But it is for today. The message of the cross is for me today. The power and the wisdom of God flow through that. Now, so here's what happens with these, these enemies of the cross of Christ, what they do. Or what's, where, they're gonna, where their, their destiny is. It says, whose end is destruction. So what is the ultimate destiny, ultimately, of a person that continues to be an enemy of, or have, be enemies of the cross of Christ? Jesus Christ and what he did for us on that cross. That's what it is, the cross of Christ. It's not just anybody. It's Jesus that hung on the cross for you and for me. And the message is, I'm pushing it aside as this is not important. I've got much bigger things to deal with than looking to Jesus and the cross. I've got this big mountain in front of me, this obstacle. And so what happens is a person will begin to spiral down to the point. Listen, this is what happens. So they're not even looking to God. They're not looking at specifically at Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so the power and the wisdom of God is not available to them. They shut down the power. We, as Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. The power and the wisdom of God goes on to say that his foolishness, the foolishness of God is wiser than all the wisdom of man. And the, the weakness of God is, is more powerful than all the power of man combined his, his weakness is more powerful than all the things of man combined. And so what, what happens is, that's why Paul says we preach Christ crucified, this message of the cross, because as we grab a hold of it, it is the power and the wisdom of God to me. Now, if I'm rejecting it, there is no power and a wisdom of God available to me because I'm doing things in my own flesh. I am doing things according to my own ability my own capability, my own effort, sometimes my own righteousness that says, well, I'm good enough. I'm good enough, God, and you owe me because I've been such a great person. You owe me something. And here we are, a, an enemy of the cross because you know what you did for me? What you did for me, Lord, doesn't mean anything. Is what I'm saying to the Lord because... I'm going by who I am, my righteousness, my ability. And so now I have no wisdom and no power of God available to me. Listen, you're going to keep spiraling down unless you get out of that spiral. Your ultimate end, and this is what I see people. I, listen, we need to pray for one another. Just dealing with a situation where there's, there's a turning from God because you know what, God, I, I did things for you, and now you, you owe me because I did something for you. You owe me. And so if you don't come through for me, what, what am I going to do that then? So I'm going to turn from God then because you didn't come through for me because I, I don't even believe that you can come through for me. And so the Lord doesn't come through. Eventually, he'll get to the point, you know what, there's no point in serving God. And ultimate. Ultimately, this passage comes true. It says, whose end is 
destruction. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. I came that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. And we're saying we're denying the things of Jesus at this point in time, what he did for us and our ultimate destiny. Unless we recognize the lie and the, of the enemy, unless we recognize, unless there's a ref, revelation, unless there's a, the fear of God falls upon the individual, Eventually, they'll say, you know what, there's no, there's no point in serving God, and I'm going to serve myself. Listen to what it says next. It says, whose God is their belly. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. <laughs> what is it? Now, I, just yesterday, um, Julie and I went out to eat. It was her, her birthday yesterday. Sorry, Julie, or happy birthday, Julie. Not sorry, but I did, if, if uh, you didn't want anybody to know, they know now. So anyways. Um, so anyways, I said, you know what? It is kind of neat. I said, are you, are you looking forward to, to going out for lunch? And she says, oh, yeah, I am. I said, uh, I said isn't it interesting how God designed us? He basically he designed us to be able to enjoy eating. Didn't have to. To be able to to taste, and I recognize there's when I have a a cold or whatever, your sinuses are all, all plugged up. In fact, all I have to do is plug your nose, and you can't taste anything you eat just by plugging your nose. But the thing is, the thing about whose God is their belly, it's, a, it's all about the gratification of the flesh. I'm just, I'm doing everything for myself. If I'm doing anything, I'm going to do it in my, my own effort, my own strength for myself. Whose God is their belly. I think our, our stomach is probably the fact that we, is, is a, a huge part of our our daily flesh. It's interesting when it comes to fasting and, fasting and prayer. There's a thing of, um, you know what? The thing that we need, our body, our physical body, we need to eat. You cannot go on without eating. Eventually, you will starve to death. We need to eat. But here, there's this this thing of, you know what, there's a dependence on the flesh, there's a dependence on myself, there's a gratification of the flesh. I'm going to gratify myself, what I want. And sometimes we come to God and say, well, God, I've done this for you, you owe me. We make these, these vows with God. Oftentimes we make a vow to God, God says, okay, and then we don't keep our vow. Lord, you give me what I want. I will serve you for the rest of my life. Oh, yeah? How come you don't serve him even before? How come you don't give him everything? Lord, I'm going to trust in you in the good times and in the bad, and especially in the storms of life and the difficulties of life. Lord, I'm going to acknowledge you and what you did for me on a cross 2,000 years ago says, and whose glory is in their shame, the things that are shameful, they're, they're glorying in, they're boasting in their shame, I, I, in this shameful behavior. It's like, oh my goodness, really? People are at a point where they're proud of the things that they're doing that are contrary to God, and they glory, they boast in, in the things that are their shame. They don't see it that way who set their mind on earthly things. You know what? How long can we live? How long can we live before we die? I saw a video uh, of a, a man that was in World War II. He was a pilot in World War II. And he was, I think he was 101 as of the writing or 
Yeah, I would, or 101. He's going to be 102 this year. He's still alive, very sharp of mind and what, whatever. And I was just, oh, how long can a person live? If you reach 100, compared to eternity, is nothing. It is nothing. Even if we lived, you know, we say, oh, man, somebody that's in their 80s or, or even their 90s or whatever, you say, well, they, they've had a good long life. And some of you younger folk might say, you know what? Wow, what Pastor Dave is, he's getting pretty old already. I still, I still think that I'm, I'm fairly young, you know, as I've, I've crossed the, the 60 barrier. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm still young. There's a lot of things I can still do. But some of you younger, you younger people, young adults might say, oh, what an old guy that guy is. He thinks he's young, eh? It's like, I don't think so. Uh, how much time can we, how much time do we have on this planet? Where are we going to spend eternity? And the person that is opposed, listen, the enemies of the cross of Christ who set their mind on earthly things. It's not long term. They're, they're, they're thinking short term. And so what do you set your mind on? What do we set our mind on? It's, well, you know what? It's going to be the things of this earth. I want to accumulate things. I want to have things. It's like we can't take them with it, with us. I'm not saying there's there's nothing wrong with with having things, but you know what? When things have us, that's that's when it starts to become an issue. But they're, they're they set their mind on earthly things rather than eternal things. All right. So this is how this ver this chapter ends. Uh, there's a few more verses. Uh, well, let me, let me just read verse 20 because it changes. This, that was the, the, basically the definition of enemies of the cross. talks about their, their destiny, their, their end. It talks about, you know, what, what it's all about. It's about themselves, their own flesh, gratification. They glory in the things that are shameful before God who set their mind on earthly things. So this, these are the things of the enemies of the cross of Christ. But he, Paul, is, or, or Paul is writing, he says, for our citizenship is in heaven. It's not on this earth. Listen, we, we have an eternal destiny that is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glory, glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. He is, he is above all things. And there's a transformation that will take place. Ephesians 1.19 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? He's saying these, th there's a power that is available to us that is mighty, that is powerful, and even to the point of us being changed in a twinkling of an eye. I just want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 quickly. Just near the end. The chapter, this whole chapter talks about, uh, or there's, there's talk in this chapter, especially as we reach near the end, it talks about what's going to happen in a, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, where there's going to be a change from a mortal body to an, an immortal body in a split moment. Praise God. Thank God. In a twinkling of an eye, we will go from that which is of corruption, that which is decaying, and that which is, is fading. And, and uh, I recognize, you know, sometimes there's aches and pains. I got a, a new little ache that's come up, and it's like, okay, I don't know what this is all about in my finger. Uh, it's like, what, what is that? Arthritis? I don't know. But all I say is this. We're, there's going to be a change from this corruptible body to incorruption. There's nothing to be of decay in us. And here it says, I just want to read close to the end. So it says in verse 52 or verse 51. Let me go back to 50. I'm just reading backwards here. Our final victory is, is one of the titles that they give this, these next verses. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh... And blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You can't make it. I can't make it. We can't make it. Nobody can make it. 
and inherit the kingdom of God, even enter the kingdom of God by flesh and blood. Our effort, our righteousness, our flesh, our abilities, our capabilities, we cannot make it into the kingdom of God. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. You might say, those that are dead in Christ that have died as believers, they do not have a physical body yet. They, their spirit and soul is in heaven. Their body is buried, it's cremated, whatever it may be. But there is a day coming. The trumpet will sound in this twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. So the spirit and soul will be connected with a brand new incorruptible body that's going to be raised. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality to live forever forever. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. We're going to be talking a little bit about the law if I have time. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The victory comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not just Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, I bow my knee. Every tongue or every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so we have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The things that we do in the Lord as our faith is in the Lord, we're not enemies of the cross. All right. Hallelujah. So, quickly now, for we are the circumcision. We're talking about dogs. We're talking about evil individuals, evil workers. We're talking about this mutilation. And then right away it goes into, for we are the circumcision. Paul, we're, we're Jews. We're of the circumcision on the eighth day. And he, he'll go on to talk about this. Who worship God in the spirit, in the Holy Spirit. We, we can exalt God. We can lift him up. We can exalt him. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh though I also might have confidence in the flesh. So what, what does that mean? Or he's saying, listen, for goodness sake, don't you place your confidence in your own abilities, your own efforts, your own righteousness. Do not have confidence. Have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. What is he saying here? He's basically saying, if anybody depended on the flesh, it was me. That's how I used to live. And now he goes into these things. He says, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Man, did I have, I just trusted in my own flesh. And here, now he goes through the whole thing. He says, I was circum circumcised the eighth day. My parents had me circumcised on the eighth day when I was born, after I was born. Of the stock of Israel... There was no mixed blood. My mom, my dad, basically saying my mom and dad are, are Jews. I'm a pure-blooded Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, what, what was significant about the tribe of Benjamin compared to uh, some, most of the other tribes? What was significant about the tribe of Benjamin? Anybody? What happened to, or which part of the kingdom of Israel, or the, the northern or southern, was Benjamin a part of? Was, was Benjamin a part of the northern kingdom that split after 
King Solomon, there was King Saul, King David, and then King Solomon, his son. And then after that, the King Rehoboam, there was a split. And you had this northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Which kingdom was Benjamin a part of? What do you think? You got a 50-50% chance of getting it right. So I hear north, south. Well, there's only two answers, north or south. So you, you, some of you got it right. It was part... South, north, okay. Uh, it was, the, the northern tribe had 10 different tribes in it. The southern tribe, we're not counting uh, the Levites, because they had no possession. They didn't have land. So we have two left. We have Judah, we have Benjamin, was the southern kingdom, which lasted way longer because the northern kingdom had no, uh, they, like I said, mentioned the last number of weeks, they, there was 19 kings in a row, and not one single one of those kings served God. Not one from the northern kingdom. And that's why their demise, God gave them about 240 or so years before they were taken out. And they were captured and taken by the Assyrian uh, superpower. And what was left was just Judah and Benjamin. And they went for another 100, almost 200 years, or 160 years or so. And then it was because of wickedness by some of the kings that God allowed for Babylon, the next empire superpower after uh, the Assyrians were the, the Babylonians. And the Babylonians came in and they took out uh, Judah and Benjamin. So here he's saying, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. <clears throat> so that was, hey, I think the only other tribe that would have been uh, above would have been Judah uh, when it came to being a good tribe to be a part of. He says, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Like if anybody, I'm, I'm, Hebrew, I'm a Hebrew and of, of the Hebrews, I'm one of the, the top. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. I wasn't just anybody that kept the law. I was a Pharisee and kept the law. In fact, they were thinking that, that Paul, whose name was Saul before, would eventually take over as one of the lead Pharisees. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He thought that what he was doing was the right thing. I had zeal. Let me tell you how much zeal he had. Acts 8 and 3 says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, women, committing them to prison. He was zealous to do this. I'm going to do this. They're not doing the things of God, and I'm coming against them. In Acts 22, 4 and 5, and this is Paul writing, or speaking. He says, I persecuted this way, the way, to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women as also the high priest bears me witness and all the council of the elders from whom I also re received letters to the brethren and I went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished, to go to another country, take those that were Jews that may have gone. I had, I had letters to go take them and bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. I was given permission to do that. Acts 26, 9 to 11 says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, to deny Jesus, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. This is concerning the righteousness. This is concerning zealousness. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, according to the law, blameless. Wow, did he think a lot of himself. If, I, if there was anybody that had opportunity to, to go by the flesh and boast and... and, and, and it was me. 
to have confidence in the flesh, I had confidence in my flesh. Now listen to what happens though. Verse 7. But what things were gained to me, the things that I had gained, all that I had gained, these I have counted loss for Christ. They were nothing compared to Jesus Christ. Nothing. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of even just the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Jesus, the one I was fighting against and, and killing his followers, he says, I've counted all the things that I've, I've done and I recognize, man, the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my life, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. I like the King James Version says, not rubbish, but dung. All these things that I thought were so important, dung, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. So I was saying earlier, the flesh is about our righteousness, which is from the law, me trying to do keep the law. And so if I can keep the law, I'm working it out by the law. I'm the one that's doing it. I'm keeping the law. But not, I was found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. How are we found in Christ? By faith. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. Me trying to, attempting to keep the law. I can't, you can't keep the law. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. How are we found to be righteous before, before God? The righteousness which is from God by faith. It comes from him. And as our faith is in Jesus Christ, we're not an enemy of the cross. The righteousness of Jesus is upon me. And man, now... I recognize just by faith I can be glad and rejoice because the righteousness that is on me is not my righteousness, his righteousness on me. And what a, what a, a rest I have, what a rejoicing I now have in that. I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He says, he goes on to say that I may know him. I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. I want to know. I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to have fellowship with his sufferings. Even if I suffer because of Jesus, I want to, fellowship, I want to have fellowship with his suffering. What did Jesus suffer for us? What did he do for us? Hmm? He went to the cross for us. He says, I want to have a fellowship. I want to have interaction with what he did for me on the cross. He went to the cross for me. The fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, even as he died, Lord, that my flesh would die. My flesh is a nasty thing. This was what it says in Romans 6. And we're talking about knowing Christ. We're talking about moving forward in our walk daily so we can walk even in this place of joy to rejoice in gladness no matter what's going on around us. It says in Romans 6, 3, it says, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? The moment, you might say, are, are they talking about water baptism here? No. They're talking about a spiritual baptism takes place the moment that we believe in Christ and we are baptized into his death, we, the moment we place our faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus, I'm a sinner. You took all my sins upon yourself. My faith is in you. You died for me. You were buried. You rose again. I believe. I trust in you. My faith is in you. You are my Savior. Come into my life. You be Lord of my life. And as we believe these things, the moment we believe that we are baptized into Christ Jesus and we're also baptized into his death, 
We're crucified with Christ. Now listen what happens. And think about it. Think about it. You were not saved because of how good you were, but think about your emotional estate or state the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ. I don't know if you felt it when you gave your life to Jesus. I know what I felt when I gave my life to Jesus. There was a peace that flooded my soul. I was in fear and I was in torment, even as a seven-year-old. And the joy that flooded my soul when I gave my life to Jesus as a seven-year-old boy. Why? My faith was in, not in myself. Because I was wondering what was going to happen in the future. And there was no way that as a seven-year-old I could do anything about the future and the things that were coming and that have still not come yet. But you might say, Pastor, are you afraid about the future? No, absolutely not, because I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going because my faith of where my faith is in, it's not in myself, it's in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so there's this thing, we're, we're baptized into His death. Just as, therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into His death, just as He died and was buried, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall also walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, this newness of body. I just say, thank you, Lord, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And listen, that thing is not just when, we, when the trumpet sounds and we are caught up in the twinkling of an eye, but we are also raised from the, the, the death state that we were in before Christ. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And the moment we believe we are raised to newness of life, to resurrection from the dead. We just say, thank you, Lord. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. It's nothing you have done. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace... You have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Not, not by anything that we could do. Now, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there because uh, I still have another th two and a half pages. So I, I, won't, uh, I won't continue. I, I, I want you... If you want to rejoice in the Lord, it's about where your faith is at. Can we stand together? Because I want to pray. Uh, and next time, we'll continue on with moving forward. And uh, moving forward in Christ. Um, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I, I just pray for my dear brothers and sisters here, those that may be watching online right now or will be watching down the road. I pray for them as well right now. Lord, I pray we will have zero confidence in our own flesh, in our own abilities, our capabilities, in our own righteousness, our own efforts, whatever that we would say the main thing that I need to do, that I can rejoice in the Lord, that I would not be an enemy of the cross of Christ. Lord, I, that we would say, we acknowledge you. We acknowledge what you did for us daily. As you said, Jesus, if you're going to follow me, if you want to be my disciples, deny yourself, deny your effort, your righteousness, your self-righteousness, your abilities, your capabilities, your disciplines, your, all your hard work, deny it and take up the cross daily, daily and follow me. Lord, a confession of faith daily. Lord, I would say that it wouldn't just be daily. I would say, Lord, it would be continual. The moment we wake up, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be great in my life. 
Lord, that the name of Jesus Christ that goes hand in hand with what he did for us on the cross. That's the, the main reason, the, the ultimate reason, and ultimately the only reason that he came was to go to the cross so that we could have life as we would place our faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. I pray that there would be a confession daily. Jesus, I acknowledge what you did for me. I acknowledge your name that is above every name and what your sacrifice, which is above every sacrifice, and I acknowledge that. Let your name and sacrifice be great in my life today. Lord, tonight as I go to bed, I pray. Lord, even as I would declare, Jesus, your name and your sacrifice, when I lay my head down and as I, I, I go to sleep, Lord, let there be a work done that is great in my life, in my body, my soul, and my spirit. And Lord, I pray that this would be extended Lord, to, to my wife, to my children, their spouses, our granddaughter, my mother, my, my brothers biologically and their families, and every brother and sister here in the, in the church tonight. Lord, those that are not here tonight, I pray for our brothers and sisters and their families, saved or not saved. I declare your name great, your finished work great over them. We speak your name and your finished work over them. Lord, for the body of Christ in Niagara, in the Niagara region, and Lord, for every person that doesn't know you, we speak your name and your finished work over them. Let the, your name be great in their life, even to the point of salvation of entire, not just individuals, but entire families, entire clans. Lord, aunts and uncles, cousins, the ex these, these extended families, these clans would be saved yet before your return. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, let us begin to rejoice. Thank you, Jesus. We don't have to work our way into heaven. You've already accomplished. You are the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to Father except through you. We are coming through you we, as we acknowledge you. In Jesus' name. I pray blessing on my dear brothers and sisters, and I pray blessing especially on, on the ladies, those that are, are going to be getting together tonight. Lord, Lord just have, have, have a great time, a wonderful time together of fellowship. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Can we give the Lord... Hey, guys. It's Matt. I really hope you enjoyed that sermon today. If you'd like to check out more of them, they're going to be here and here. Have a great day. God bless.